nation. The diggers who fought a distant war. And the pitched battles on our own soil. A fast ball caught him on the temple and he staggers away from the wicket. So this is cricket. The conflicts large and small that tested our character and brought our days as a child of the British Empire to an end. That all the advancing that will be done will be by Australians, for it is Australians that stand for the policy of advancing Australia. the great Benjamin Franklin in another time and place who said there was never a good war or a bad peace. I don't think that anyone would argue with that. But one of the great tests of a nation is how it handles conflict. Conflict in war and conflict at home. Australia's had its fair share of both for such a young country. In our century we've put the lives of young Australians at risk in two world wars and on other killing fields. We've won and lost battles of diplomacy but thankfully Australia itself has not been divided too many times. It's Gallipoli, 1990. After 75 years, the last of the diggers return to say a last farewell to their lost mates. Those 11,000 Anzacs who laid down their lives. The going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. They remember all too well. So they gave me a tin hat, and they gave me a gun. And they marched me away to the war. And the band played waltzing. In 1914, the streets had been full of young men busting to join up. The great adventure and a chance to prove ourselves as members of the Empire. Gallipoli was our first battle on the world stage. We sailed off for Gallipoli. Gallipoli had been a grand scheme that went gloriously wrong. The idea had been to invade Turkey from the sea and open up a second front to the European war. The fighting that took place on the beaches of Gallipoli would become our national symbol for courage and sacrifice. But the campaign was badly planned, a military stalemate that bordered on suicide. Occupying the high ground, the Turkish forces had pinned down the Allies. They hardly moved off the beach. Only one remarkable reel of film was shot at Gallipoli by a war photographer we don't even know. It shows a human ant's nest where soldiers dug in and waited till someone sent them over the top to die. For eight months, the British High Command sacrificed young Australians and many others in the failed campaign. Then they pulled them out and sent them to France. Ironically, the withdrawal was an outstanding success. They didn't lose a man. The Anzac tradition had been born. But it would be the sheer number who were killed that stunned all who came into contact with the First World War. Of 416,000 Australians who went, more than half were either killed or wounded. A sepia study, and for years it was all that remained of young Russell Bazisto. An apprentice baker from Adelaide, he was the only son in a family of five girls. 
He could have been any one of the thousands of Aussie diggers who moved from Gallipoli to France and the horrors of the Western Front. On the 4th of August, Russell took part in the Battle of Poziers, and with it, an action to capture a window, the key German lookout. It was one of Australia's greatest triumphs and tragedies. This was the Australian breakthrough. But at the end of this six-week campaign, there were 23,000 Australians who died, and one of them was Russell Basisto of Adelaide. But it seemed that no one would ever know. His body would be swallowed up by the quagmire of the battlefield. To the despair of his family, Russell Basisto simply ceased to exist. Where have all the young men gone? Gone to graveyards, every one. Eighty-two years after the battles were over, a French farmer accidentally discovered Russell Basisto's long-lost body. As if to reach back through time, even his kit and belongings were recovered. <laughs> Today our diggers are remembered and honoured. In their flickering twilight hours, these four heroes collect the French Legion of Honour on behalf of every Anzac who passed this way in another lifetime. And for Adelaide's Russell Basisto, finished at 21 before life had even begun, it's the final farewell he deserved. It's the 1930s. Some Australians ignore the gum trees and still pretend that it's England. Nothing, it seemed, was more important than our links with the home country. Yet our passion and patriotism for all things British was being sorely tested. The problem was money. Australia is facing today the gravest financial crisis in its history. The Great Depression, which had plunged the world economy into chaos in 1929, hit Australia worse than most. Our economy depended on trade with the mother country. But British banks were in no mood to be benevolent. The money men from Threadneedle Street demanded that Australia repay the great loans that they'd given us after their First World War, even though our national income had dropped by half within just a year. Australia was broke, but somehow we scraped up the money. Everyone played along, that's everyone, except New South Wales Premier Jack Lang. In 1932, Big Jack became a working class hero when he told the British banks to go jump, and he refused to pay. There was also Jack Lang, who decided that it was much cheaper to open the Sydney Harbour Bridge himself, rather than pay for a member of the British royal family. He was a rebel with a cause, but he couldn't go on. For the first time in the history of Australia, His Excellency the Governor, representing the King, had seen fit to dismiss his ministers because they were involving the Crown in illegal acts. Now the Governor's decision to sack Jack Lang had the backing of Canberra and the other Australian states. But it was the first dismissal in our history. And the fact that Sir Philip Game was appointed by the British just made it worse. 1932 would be quite a year. If bank bullies and busting Big Jack was bad, then Bodyline was unacceptable. The Poms called it by the fancy name of Leg Theory. But in this war of 1932, young Aussie boys from the bush, like Don Bradman, would have to put their bodies on the line again. Only this time, it was against the British. And during the 30s, the ashes were huge events. 160,000 Sydney siders rolled up for the first test. After all, the future of the empire was at stake. Four years since we were in Australia. It's very nice to be here again. And pleasant to find that 
In spite of the depression, the big cities haven't changed very much. Now what could an English gentleman like Captain Douglas Jardine possibly know about Australia and the Depression? Aloof and aristocratic, Douglas Jardine always seemed to be dismissive and looking down his long aquiline nose at the Aussies. I should like to present to you Don Bradman, the possessor of more records than a gramophone company. Everyone knew that Bodyline was meant to stop our greatest hero, the Don. Because in England in 1930, the boy from Barrel had rewritten the record books. Harold Larwood, a coal miner from Yorkshire, was Jardine's lethal weapon. Larwood to Bradman. Larwood was fast and furious. Bowling body line, he was also deadly. In Adelaide, the city of churches, the war finally erupted during the third test when the legendary Bill Woodfull copped it. The Australian captain continues to duck, but one ball kicks up suddenly and caught him over the heart. That was rather a nasty one, and it made the plucky Woodfull feel rather sick at the moment. Old Bill Woodfull was the sport's fatherly figure. His famous comment on the day, only one side out there is playing cricket. But there was more to come. Oldfield, who had been batting splendidly, bit the dust in this little duel. A fast ball caught him on the temple and he staggers away from the wicket. So this is cricket. This commentator kept his cool, but the fans certainly didn't. Oldfield had a fractured skull and mounted police were called in to control the now furious Adelaide crowd. Hostile telegrams flooded London. There was even talk of calling off the tour. But when it came to covering the fourth and deciding test, which was played in Brisbane, the English commentators, viewing the film from 10,000 miles away, couldn't see what all the fuss was about. In the boiling heat, Larwood opens his shock attack, holding first the orthodox off theory. Runs, however, come with slow assurance and Larwood reverts to his leg theory, which the crowd mildly resents. There was nothing mild about it. England won the Ashes and rejected the protests as just whinging Aussies. But shortly after, the MCC banned Bodyline for good. But what of Bodyline's main target, John Bradman? Jardine's strategy certainly slowed him down. But when he faced Larwood during the second test played in Melbourne, Bradman still managed 103 not out. It's 1942. The Japanese have no fear of flying and they point their planes towards Australia. Now this is a frightening view. This is Darwin from the cockpit of a Japanese bomber. Bombs rain on Darwin. A devastating raid shatters the town. Batter shipping in the harbour. Many hundreds died in that one onslaught. For the first time in our history, an enemy had knocked down Australia's front door. Darwin was evacuated. That means clearly and specifically that every human being in this country is now, whether he or she likes it, at the service of the government to work in the defence of Australia. Prime Minister John Curtin was defiant. He was also a worried man. It was only two months since the Japanese had entered World War II by bombing Pearl Harbor. Now they were camped just 500 kilometres from Australia. Too little, too late. And so Singapore burned. We had figured that Australia was safe. The British base at Singapore was impregnable. But when Singapore surrendered on February the 15th, 1942, we lost our British insurance policy and we lost 15,000 Australian troops who were taken prisoner. The bulk of the Australian army was fighting the Germans and Italians in the Middle East. But when in this moment of national peril, we asked for them, it was Britain that stood in the way. In direct opposition to the plans and wishes of Winston Churchill and President Roosevelt, Prime Minister John Curtin, back to the hilt by his wartime cabinet, had insisted on the return of our Middle East forces to defend Australia. The Battle of the Kokoda Track would be our last stand. 13,000 of Japan's battle-hardened, crack troops were moving across New Guinea. 
There to block them, the 39th Battalion. 500 conscripts had originally been intended for home duty, in Australia only. These boys had never fired a gun in anger. But these were desperate times, and in desperation, they were sent north. Their job? To hold the line until the regular army could make it back from the Middle East. Somehow, the 39th Battalion did hold out for a full month until help finally came. Australia thrills. The AIF is home. Home from Libya, Greece, Palestine to help throw the invader back. Home but momentarily. With cruelly short leave, they must go north and into battle again. Within an hour, these fresh troops, AIF units with splendid battle records won in the Middle East, will be in contact with the Japanese. They move up through the dim, dank, steaming jungle. The rarely seen enemy is close. The New Guinea campaign lasted until January 1943. It was the first time the Japanese juggernaut had been stopped and turned back in the year-long blitz across the Pacific. If anyone doubted just how close we came to invasion, then try this. They had already printed this crisp new currency for the Japanese government of Australia. Eight, seven. It's 1952 and Britain is about to become an atomic power with a bomb set off in a remote section of the Western Australian coast. Six, five. After Montebello, they're bound for South Australia to Maralinga where 11 more British atom bombs go off in the desert. Four, three. It seemed a jolly good idea at the time. The British were our friends and our allies, and we had all that empty space. Two, one, zero. The mighty power of the atom is unleashed. Remember, the world in the 1950s seemed a very dangerous place. This was at the height of the Cold War. Yet in recent years, a sinister force has appeared in our world. Its leader and its army preach a new gospel. Moscow and Washington were eyeballing one another. In each fist, they held an atomic bomb. By the mid-1980s, the Cold War and communism were almost forgotten. But the memory of those atomic tests in South Australia lingered on. Thirty years after the British scientists packed up and flew home, we began to count the cost of living with the bomb. 1,500 Australian servicemen were in the field during those tests. Nobody wore protective clothing. Nobody knew. Aboriginal tribes even went walkabout through this traditional country. And years later, they would all learn the legacy of cancer and other serious illness. In 1985, an Australian Royal Commission found that three of the 12 nuclear tests were hurried and unsafe. Even worse, the British tests had dumped radioactive rain across Australia, maybe increasing our level of cancer in the general population. It's a beautiful but horrifying spectacle. Scientists say that the amount of radioactive fallout was almost negligible. The scientists were terribly wrong. An air sample taken in Adelaide two days after one test recorded an astonishing increase in radioactivity from 100, wait for it, to 95,000 counts. Summing up, the Royal Commission was brutally critical. And the evidence which has already been adduced before us suggests that they told the Australian authorities almost nothing about what they were doing in Australia during the tests. That was a very different view from British scientist Lord Penny, who'd suggested that we should love the bomb as much as he loved the Aussie real estate. I thought that Woomera and the area north and a few hundred miles away uh, gave uh, an absolutely first-class site for the testing of modern weapons. Statues like this one can be found in suburban parks and country towns right across Australia. Marble memories of the Boers and the Great World Wars and even the Malayan campaign, when Australians rushed off to die for the glory of the British Empire.
But since those atomic tests of the 1950s, attitudes and times have certainly changed. The turning point may well have been Kokoda. For the first time, we were fighting for Australia, fighting for our own homes, and Britain could do nothing to help us. So we looked towards America. Now, of course, in peace, our shops and our showrooms all say made in Japan. While Australians travelling to Britain today wait in line at the customs counter marked aliens as Germans come and go freely. If you've enjoyed our century, be sure to get a copy of the soundtrack CDs featuring music from the series, available at all good record stores. No shave. That's why soldiers wear tin hats.